So our big theme going forward now is going to be how we can apply some of all this derivative work that we've been doing. Because so far, almost everything has just been bare math techniques for just how do you find a derivative. Now we're getting into, okay, how do I use that in various situations and what can we figure out with that? So here's our first problem. And today we're kind of connecting with stuff we've talked about before, like position and velocity and stuff like that. In this case, I'm given an equation here that represents the position of this particle. So I know that this represents position. And again, notice S tends to be used as position. All right. So we want to figure out what the position is after two seconds here. What am I going to do to figure out the position after two seconds? Yep. All we have to do in this case is plug in the two for t. Uh, there's no fancy derivatives or anything like that here because it's already the position function. You're just going to take the 2 and plug it in for t there. All right, when we do so, when we plug in that 2, uh, we end up getting a final answer of negative 14 feet. So that's the s value here. s of 2 is negative 14. What does that actually tell us about the location of the particle that's being described here. Yeah, after two seconds, it, it's going to be 14 feet away. But the real question is, which way? Yeah. Right? Uh, and really, that would depend on a definition that we don't have here. Uh, maybe the right, this particle is moving along. Maybe that was described as positive, in which case this would mean this was moving 14 feet to the left. Or perhaps uh, this means positive direction would be like away from us. In which case, this would mean that it went 14 feet backwards, like behind us, in that sort of a case. Or maybe it was up and down. If up was defined as positive, then this thing went 14 feet down. It all depends on exactly where it was defined. But it does tell us that whatever the negative direction is defined to be, this thing was 14 feet in that direction. Now there's some little details in that that we often forget about and neglect. So it'd be useful to put this into your notes as well as some other notes we'll be getting as we go today. And you notice a few little details in these notes here. Uh, one is, notice that it is the signed distance, which is why we don't just say distance here because distance is like a total value generally. So distance is just positive. So like in that last problem where we found that it was at negative 14, its distance away from the start was just 14. Distance would not have had a positive or negative to it. So position actually has the positive or negative so that we know where it is relative to where we started from. And then positive position, that means it's moving in the positive direction. So it's always going to be a matter of which direction is defined to be positive as we go through here. And then zero position, make sure you understand that if it's got an S value of zero, that means it's exactly where it started from. It hasn't moved any which way. All right, next up. And now I'd like you to find the velocity of the exact same situation. Our situation hasn't changed, but please find now the velocity at time t. And hopefully you're remembering here that velocity is the derivative of the position. All right, and so to find that velocity, we're doing the derivative of our s function. And so our derivative then is going to be this, 3t squared minus 16t plus 5. So now that we have that, again, I'd like to know what was the velocity after two seconds. And so to find that velocity after two seconds, we plug the two into our velocity function that we just found here, and we end up with a negative 15 feet per second. Did you remember the units as you're finding that out? Make sure that you are. All right, so it's negative 15 feet per second. So if it's negative 15, what does that tell us about what's happening to this thing at the two second mark? And so, yeah, that 
that negative 15 is telling us that this is moving in the negative direction at 15 feet per second. That's really what this means, is that at this moment, it's moving in the negative direction. Now, in the last problem, we found the position was negative 14. In this case, we found the velocity was negative 15. Is it possible for the position to be negative and the velocity to be positive? Well, the positive velocity would just mean that it was moving in the positive direction. Is it possible that you're in the negatives but moving in the positive direction? Yes. And so, yes, that would be possible there. Uh, some of these things can bend our brains a little bit, which is, I think, kind of the fun of it. But you're going to find all sorts of these different little combinations as you go. All right. So next up, when is this particular particle at rest? Well, what would it mean for it to be at rest? Yeah, it would mean the velocity would be zero because at rest means it's stopped. It's not moving at all. So if we want to figure out where this is at rest, we got to figure out where this thing equals zero. So please do so. So you set the whole equation equal to zero, and then you notice you have a quadratic set equal to zero that you're solving from there. Well, in order to solve a quadratic, uh, we could try factoring it, or we could use the quadratic formula. I'm hoping it's factorable so I don't have to use the quadratic formula. So make sure that you are checking the factorization first. And yes, it is factorable. You should have come up with 3t minus 1 times t minus 5. And based off of that, we then can find our solutions. What makes each of those parentheses individually equal 0? And so we should have 1 third and 5 seconds as the times at which this particle is at rest. All right, so now that we know when it was at rest, it actually is going to allow us to figure out some other stuff that maybe wasn't quite as obvious otherwise. The next thing we're going to figure out is when was this particle moving, like whole intervals kind of when here, when was it moving in the positive direction and when was it moving in the negative direction? And so let's think about how we can know that. Uh, let's go with a simple example here. Um, I'm just going to make a rough sketch of our graph here. So that's our original function. Uh, it was moving in the positive direction for part of it, and it was moving in the negative direction for part of it. Based on that original s function here, can we tell where it was moving in the positive or negative direction? So if I take a look at this, uh, at let's say this point right here, if I was trying to figure out if it was moving positive or negative, or maybe I wouldn't know, I actually could know in this kind of a case. Because up is positive, down is negative, and the graph at this point is moving downward, right? So it is heading toward the negative, therefore we would say that's a negative direction. Okay. So then, what's happening then, let's see here, here. Is this moving in a positive direction or a negative direction? Yep. Is that graph increasing or decreasing there? Increasing. That's why, yes, it'd be moving in a positive direction there. And so, really, what are we looking at in order to decide if it's moving in a positive or a negative direction? the slope. And the slope is determined by what that we've been working with all year long? Yeah, the derivative. And so the derivative is what tells us our slope. So really, if I want to know when this thing is going positive and negative, I could also be looking at the graph of my velocity function. So I could also just be looking at that. Okay, now let's say I was looking at velocity. Uh, if I was here, would I be able to tell whether that graph is moving in the positive or negative direction there? Actually, I couldn't know at that point. I can only know that if this is a velocity graph, if I actually know where the axes are. Then I can know 
Okay, well, if it's up here, say, okay, now it's above the axis, therefore my velocity is positive, therefore it's moving in a positive direction. Whereas here, notice that's a negative velocity. It's in the negatives. And so since that's in the negatives, then that would be a negative velocity, and therefore I'd be moving in the negative direction. So knowing all that then, where does it switch from negative to positive? Well, it's where it's crossing the axis, yeah. What's, what would we say is happening to this particle when it's crossing the axis there? Yeah, so if it's switching like from negative to positive or positive to negative, what happens right at that point where it switches? What is the velocity right there? Zero, which is where it was at rest, right? That's why we did the previous problem that we did first, is because we wanted to figure out where it was at rest. Because basically what that told us is it told us what these two points were going to be. It told us where it actually switches, which means then we can actually figure out where it's positive and where it's negative. So if I actually take a look and actually put those numbers in, uh, I have a couple different ways I could then answer this question. One is I can go ahead and sketch the graph. Now, based on this equation, let's get a little bit more particular because I was just throwing in a sketch before. Uh, you notice it's x squared, so you know it's a parabola. Is this parabola opening upward or is this opening downward? Yep, it's opening upward because it's a positive t squared term. And so we know it's doing something like that. Obviously, that's not a very pretty graph, but it's going to give us some idea. So then I could actually start describing some intervals, right? So then, like, I don't care about what's happening in the negatives. So I'm going to start at zero here. So from zero up to a third, is it moving in the positive or the negative direction? Yes, it is positive. How do I know that? Because it's above the x-axis. It means that my velocity up here is a positive number, and a positive velocity means we're moving in the positive direction. Okay, uh, what about from one-third up to five? Positive or negative direction? Well, notice between one-third and five, I'm below the x-axis. That means my velocity is negative, and a negative velocity means a negative direction that it's moving in. That's what velocity really means. It means the direction it's moving in is going into the positive or going into the negative. All right. And then from 5 out to infinity, would it be positive or negative? It would be positive because, again, it's above that, right? So with a nice graph like this, we can just sketch the graph. And we can know that based on the graph alone. But a lot of these are ones where we may not know what the graph looks like. There's going to be a lot funkier types of equations that we're going to see. This one just happened to be a quadratic where we could instantly say this is how it's behaving. So how could we check this without making a graph for those times when we can't make the graph? By the way, when you can make the graph, like sketch it in just really quick to visualize what's going on, yes, you can do that. But what if you couldn't? Yeah, we could test any number within that interval and we could see what it's actually doing at that number. We just need to pick something that's inside of that interval. So for instance, what would be a nice pretty number to check from this first interval? Zero. Yeah, I like zero. It's a very easy number to use there. So I'm going to use zero. And what am I going to be plugging that zero into? Am I plugging it into the s function or the v function? We're wanting to know if it's moving in the positive or negative direction. I want to know whether this number is positive or negative. And so that means I'm looking at velocity then. A positive velocity means it's moving in the positive direction. A negative velocity would mean moving in the negative direction. This is a critical point. If there's anything that causes people to stumble in this section, it's this little turn here, making sure that we know what we're actually plugging it back into and what is going to be used to tell us what. So I'm going to do V of zero. And that's going to be a very easy one to do, right? Because that's just going to give me 5. Because, of course, this becomes 0 and this becomes 0 when I plug in 0 for each of those. 
So v of 0 equals 5. Notice my velocity at 0 is positive, which means then that it is moving in the positive direction there. And we could repeat the exact same process for all three of the intervals. So when you're doing one of these, if you can't make the graph, you still need to find your intervals. Now notice that to find those intervals, these numbers here were the times where the velocity was zero. So we started by setting v equal to zero and solving the equation there. Then once we did that, we knew the intervals. Then I can just grab one number from each interval and test them. All right. So if I go ahead and do that, I can test numbers in each of them. And yes, you'll find that within each of those intervals, we get the exact same things we found from the graph. All right, now there's a lot of information there, right? It's worth putting into our notes. That way you can also make sure to keep track of this as well. I'd suggest doing it right below where you did your position notes a few minutes ago. Now, as you're taking a look at these notes here, some details that are worth pointing out. Uh, first of all, notice velocity is different than speed. So speed, like if you're driving your car, speed is what displays on your speedometer. Your car doesn't care which direction you are driving. If you're driving north, south, east, west, whatever, speed is just a matter of how quickly you are getting from where you were to where you're headed. Velocity is not that way. Velocity cares about which direction you're actually moving in. So that's why velocity actually is signed. And so, again, like we've just been talking about with the positive velocities and the negative velocities, that's going to change based on which direction you're actually moving at that moment. All right. Uh, the other big thing to remember here, it's a tiny detail, one that's actually the most familiar coming in, but it's so important as you've seen that zero velocity is going to come up a lot. We're going to need to know when the velocity is zero so that we know when this thing's at rest. Because when it's at rest, that's often a sign that it's switching from positive to negative or negative to positive. And those are critical points as we go through these and start figuring some things out. All right, one last type of problem that we're going to be taking a look at today. Again, same starting situation. We want to figure out what is the total distance traveled within the first eight seconds. So within between time zero and eight, how far did this particle actually travel during that time? Now, if I want to know the total distance traveled, do I care about the position function or do I care about the velocity function? Yep, for total distance, it actually is going to be position. So this is going to be our primary equation right here. So that's going to be the one that we're going to be using most of here. So we want to figure out the total distance traveled within the first eight seconds. Uh, for many of us, we think this is very straightforward then. We tend to say, okay, well then, S of zero, I can go ahead and plug zero in for S, that gives me zero. And then we do S of eight. Uh, that happens to give us 40. And so we say, oh, it traveled 40. Well, it did not just travel 40 feet, though. Because during that time, if we take a look and see what a graph of this equation would look like, you notice that this thing started by traveling outward. So it was traveling in a positive direction. But then it turned around, and it started moving in the negative direction. Notice, it's already traveled more than 40 feet right there, because down here is negative 50. So it's traveled over 50 feet at this point. And then it goes from there up to the 40 that we saw that we ended with. So we need to be able to figure out that total distance traveled. Well, notice where things change. Things are changing here when our graph reaches a top or a bottom, a maximum or a minimum. So that's going to be right here, and that's going to be right here. Now, for the second one, I can pretty much look and see what number that's at, right? That's going to be at 5. What is the number 
at which this one is topping out here. Yep, it's one third. Because you'll notice that it was traveling forward and then it turned around and started traveling backwards, which means that at that moment of one third here, it was at rest. That's where our velocity was zero. And so again, we need to be able to figure out where our velocity equals zero in order to be able to find those changing times. So in reality, in order to figure out the total distance traveled here, I need to know what the position is at zero, one third, five, and eight. In other words, notice that's my two endpoints, the zero and the eight are my endpoints. And then any time it was at rest in between there, which was the one third and the five because the at rest points means that's where it changed direction. All right, so knowing this now, you have the bigger picture. Now, can you please tell me what was the total distance traveled by this particle within those eight seconds? Now, what you don't want to do here is just add up the numbers. Because if you just add these up, it's going to give you something that's a little bit biased because you know, some of these are positive and some of them are negative. If we're talking about total distance traveled though, we're really just looking at more of the absolute. We really care about the absolute value. So let's take a look at each of the intervals. So between zero and one third, how far did we travel? Yep, that's 0.81 because we went from zero up to 0.81. So obviously then we traveled 0.81 there. Okay, what about from one third up to five? How far did we travel in that interval? Yep, 50.81. Because we're going from a positive 0.81 down to a negative 50. So you find the difference of them. But notice, it's a positive 50.81. I would never say negative 50.81 here because I'm talking about the distance traveled between them. The distance, not position. All right, and then finally, between five and eight, what was the total distance traveled between those two? Well, you're going from negative 50 up to 40. That then is the total distance of 90. So now we know what each of those three interval values are. So we know how far it traveled within each of those. Now you can go ahead and figure out the total distance traveled. Now you can go ahead and just add them up, yes. And so the total distance traveled in this case then is 141.62 feet. Again, remember where we started from. Our natural instinct might have been, okay, I'm just going to figure out the zero and the eight, the endpoints. Remember why that doesn't work though. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself trying to fall back into that later because this is not just a linear relationship. It's got ups and it's got downs, and we gotta be able to count for those. All right, now, this process actually is a bit of a process. We touched on all the pieces, but I wanna formalize them, so go ahead and please add this into your notes, and this is gonna be the last thing you need to be worrying about putting into your notes today.